Thank you very much, Major, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today, and I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for such a topical and interesting conference. It's a great pleasure to be part of it. Uh, and to all of you, welcome to the final panel of the day, how to be better prepared to face indecisive or endless wars. So the central thesis of today is about winning without victory, and that implies endurance. So I think what that requires us to do is think about the Clausewitzian secondary trinity of governmental leadership, society and the armed forces. Our speakers today will each take one of the points of the triangle, but importantly, we'll also touch on the relationships between the points, because it, as in any complex system, the relationships are as important as the nodes themselves. We have to end this conference three fantastic speakers. Uh, firstly, Admiral William McRaven, secondly, Dr. Eugene Cogan, and thirdly, Dr. Isaiah or Ike Wilson III. <clears throat> Each will speak for approximately seven to ten minutes, after which we'll open the floor for questions of about 25 minutes, I think. So please, as has been said, fire your questions through in the chat. I'll introduce each speaker individually, uh, starting with Admiral William H. McRaven, who is the Professor of National Security at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. He's a retired four-star Admiral in the US Navy, where he commanded Special Operations Forces at every level as, and was in charge of US Special Operations Command. He has an extensive combat background, as you would expect, including Desert Storm and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He's a recognized national authority on US foreign policy and has advised Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama and other US leaders on defense issues. Uh, I won't go through his full biography because we only have an hour for the whole presentation, but in 2011, he was the runner up for Time Magazine's Person of the Year. In 2012, foreign policy magazine, including him, him in its top 100 global thinkers. And in 2014, Politico magazine listed him on the Politico, um, Politico 50. So I can't think of anybody better to speak on the first point of this trinity and that of leadership. Uh, Admiral Bill, sir, over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it is great to be with all of you all today. So thanks for uh, extending the invitation to me. I, I love to do these sort of panels and uh, certainly with these remarkable panelists that are joining us today. So uh, it, when I talked to Paul earlier, I said I, I wanted to kind of take a little bit of the contrarian view to start with and, and challenge the assumption that this idea of decisive victory is not inevitable. And I might turn that around and say that you know endless wars uh, are not inevitable. But I think there are kind of three components to dealing with this to ensure that we don't find ourselves in these endless wars. Uh, and and they are, there's nothing rocket science about them. The fact of the matter is, first and foremost, you have to have a clear strategy. But I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about that because I think we've, we've made some fundamental mistakes uh, over the last, certainly in the last 20 or so years. You have to have strong leadership. And then the other part of this, and certainly as we see it from the United States, and I think it probably applies in militaries uh, everywhere, is the public has to be invested in the war. Not just interested in the war, but invested in the war. So let me kind of take those and, and break them apart uh, quickly here. So, uh, you know, I, I do want to uh, quote Clausewitz. I think every military leader needs to start off with a quote from Clausewitz. And this is probably more a paraphrase than a quote. But in his book on war, he said, everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are difficult. Everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are difficult. I was telling the story the other day when I was uh, a three-star admiral in, in Afghanistan. I was heading from the United States back to Afghanistan. And this was 2009, and I was reading some uh, kind of foreign policy magazine, and there were two articles by uh, a couple of very prominent uh, PhDs, East Coast Ivy League PhDs, and this was the time when we had changed, we had begun to surge into Afghanistan, and so these PhDs were providing us uh, their wisdom on what the military needed to do, and frankly, their wisdom was a little bit condescending, but, you know, I was reading the articles, and they said, and both of them independently said, you know, the military just doesn't get it. If they would only build roads in Afghanistan, they could win this war because the roads could connect, you know, the villages to the district, the district to the province, the province, you know, to the central government. If they could only build roads, well, no shit. Why didn't we think about that? 
Well, the answer is we did think about that. It's just sort of when people are shooting at you and trying to blow you up, it's a little hard to build roads. Everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are difficult. So it is easy to sit here and say, you need a strategy, you need a strong leader, the people need to be invested. It's just hard to do. But I would offer if you go back in the, at least the late 20th century for the United States and you look at how we confronted a number of the issues, you know, Grenada, Panama, Kosovo, Bosnia, and then Desert Storm. I mean, those were, uh, those were kind of the, the, the sort of wars that had a short lived time frame because we had very, very clear strategies on how we were going to approach them. We had an exit strategy, we had an entrance strategy, and we had an exit strategy. But I will also offer that, you know, if war is this extension of policy or politics, as Clausewitz says, then you've got to start off with a very clear and thoughtful objectives. And I would offer you have to do this at all levels of warfare. So it's not just about having a grand strategy or strategy. You better think about the strategic, the operational, and the tactical, or you're going to get yourself in a lot of problems. Uh, and I would offer Afghanistan as a little bit of an example of that. You know, as we went into Afghanistan, of course, our objective was really to ensure that Afghanistan was not a safe haven for Al Qaeda. Uh, and I, and those were, you know, that was a pretty clear objective at the kind of the strategic level. We don't want Afghanistan to be a safe haven for Al Qaeda. But if we had thought through that down to the tactical level and realize that in order for Afghanistan not to be a safe haven for Al Qaeda, that meant that we were going to have to own every piece of terrain. And in owning every piece of terrain, we were going to have to engage in a war with the Taliban. And so while the, while the overarching objectives were honorable and noble and the right thing to do, you know, we may not have thought all the way through it. And as a result, we go in, we obviously, you know, kick the Taliban out of power, we put Karzai in, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves entrenched in this kind of endless war because, frankly, we had mission creep. Uh, we allowed ourselves to be trapped into the broader issue of ridding the Taliban because we didn't, I, I would offer, we probably didn't think far enough uh, ahead in terms of the tactical aspects of what was going to be required in order to achieve the strategic goals. So again, you have to kind of think through this at, at, at all those levels. Um, Next, you have to have strong leadership. And, and that, that sounds intuitive. Of course, you want strong leadership. But when I think of strong leadership at the, at the political level, it is best to have somebody that you hope is experienced, that is educated, that is thoughtful, that listens to the counsel of the generals and the admirals and the other political leaders, that understands the history and the culture and grasps the limits of power of the US or any other country, and that is careful about the hubris. You know, all of us uh, th that have been part of countries where you are the great superpower, you have this sense that we can go and do anything. And the fact of the matter is history clearly shows that is not the case. And then as a great leader, you've got to be able to confront the kind of slings and arrows that are going to come your way. You're going to have to be able to confront the criticism. And the best example I've seen in, in modern times of that actually is uh, is George Herbert Walker Bush for Desert Storm. So you think about President Bush at the time, exceptionally experienced. He had been uh, not only the vice president, he had been the director of the CIA, he had been, been the ambassador to China. Uh, so he was, he was experienced, he was highly educated at Yale, uh, a very thoughtful guy. He listened to the counsel of both General Schwarzkopf and General Powell. He understood the, the culture and the history of the region a guy that didn't have a particularly big ego. Uh, but then the, the thing that I think was most important was, as you may recall, as we went into, again, the objectives were clear. We wanted to get Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis out of Kuwait. The objective was not to overthrow Saddam Hussein. And as you recall, there was a lot of criticism at the end of, the, at the end of this 100-day war. Well, why didn't you just march to Baghdad? Well, I would offer that a lot of leaders would have, uh, have, have, have gone on, felt that pressure, and decided to march to Baghdad. But Bush had very clear objectives. Look, we're here to uh, exercise the UN resolution, get the Iraqis out of, um, out of Kuwait. That is our objective. We'll get that done. And I'm not going to be pressured into mission creep. Because had he gone on to try to push uh, Saddam out, we may have found ourselves in the same position we were in post 9-11. So 
Strong leadership is important. And then finally, this idea that the public has to be invested. Uh, you know, we in the United States, of course, have not had a draft uh, since the, uh, the mid 70s. Um, and as a result, what you find is, you know, less than 1% of the American population is in the military. And while the American people in particular have been very, very supportive of the military, and certainly after 9-11, uh, you know, the, the American public just embraced the military in a way that I hadn't seen in, in all the years I served in uniform. But uh, for most of the Americans, they didn't have somebody that was invested in the war. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the elite of America, most of their children didn't go fight in Iraq and Afghanistan. So the reason I think we had this endless war was because American boys and girls were over there fighting. But back in the United States, we were still concerned about the Super Bowl and we were concerned about, you know, uh, the day to day activity. Nothing wrong with that necessarily. But when the war overseas does not affect you domestically in a way that really gets to your heart, um, and again, I don't want to imply that the American people uh, weren't uh, conscious of the losses. They were, but as a nation, they weren't fully invested, and that allowed us to, I think, continue on in a war that kind of turned it almost into this, this endless fight. So once again, you know, everything in war is easy. It's just the easy things are difficult. Right? It is easy to stand up here and to say that we need a clear strategy, we need strong leaders, uh, and, and we need to in, have the people invested in the war. It's just hard to do. Uh, and with that, Paul, I will, uh, I'll turn it over to the other panelists. And I'm uh, anxiously uh, awaiting their, their points and, uh, and look forward to discussing this further. Admiral Will, thank you so much. And thank you as well for a brilliant introduction to, to the next speaker as well. Uh, Dr. Eugene Kogan teaches about power dynamics in negotiation and leadership at Harvard's professional development programs and conducts research at Harvard's business school. He's an expert in coercive negotiations uh, and he served as a Stanton postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Kennedy's School Alpha Center for Science and International Affairs. He now teaches Using Power Effectively, a toolkit for leaders, a professional development program at Harvard University's Division of Continuing Education. His PhD thesis was on nuclear negotiations and that won the Howard Rafer Award for the best doctoral paper on negotiation from Harvard Law School's program on negotiation. He regularly trains business, public policy and military leaders at Harvard's professional development programs. And he will speak on the importance of building society's staying power, which builds very nicely on what Admiral Bill has spoken about, because it's so important to dealing with the prolonged competition. So Eugene, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just uh, checking that you can hear me well. We can indeed. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Well, I am uh, delighted to be here. I uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. It's such a privilege to be on the same panel with Admiral Bill McRaven and uh, General Ike Wilson. Um, uh, I, uh, I appreciate, Paul, your, your generous introduction. Since Admiral McRaven teaches at the LBJ School, I can't help but mention the reaction that LBJ once had, Lyndon Baines Johnson once had, to a very nice introduction that he received. He said, and this is the same reaction I'm having to your generous introduction, LBJ said, you know, I wish my parents were here to hear this my father would believe it. My father would love it. My mother would believe it, right? So uh, I, I feel the same way about, about your kind, uh, kind words. Um, I wanna make three points in the seven to 10 minutes that I, that I have with you. And indeed they build directly on Admiral McRaven's uh, point about societal, uh, societal resilience. And the three points are, staying power, mediation, and pedagogy. And I wanna take those, uh, those in turn. I've spent several years working with studying and meeting American secretaries of state, everybody from Henry Kissinger to Rex Tillerson. So you'll forgive me if I kind of anchor some of these points with uh, thoughts that these diplomats uh, had shared. And the first one about staying power comes directly from Henry Kissinger, right? Who, of course, writing about the Vietnam War, 
was talking about how staying power, in addition to military power, cyber power, economic power, he said staying power by the society is what really matters, right? Because if, as Admiral McRaven says, if, and, and as Professor Heiser said at the beginning of the, of the conference today, if the public is not invested in whatever the military, foreign, diplomatic policy you have executing abroad, your policy will not uh, uh, come to a successful outcome, whether discreet or non-discreet, whether it is uh, victory or, or some kind of just intermediate successful outcome. You've got to have the investment by the society. And I want to point out in the next two points, two obstacles and two potential solutions uh, to the, um, this societal cohesion and societal resilience. And the two obstacles are really polarization. And I am speak, I'll be speaking heavily from the American uh, context here. And the second obstacle is the, if you will, the superficialness, if that's a word, and if it's not, I just coined it, the superficialness of a large part, and I don't want to be dismissive of the American population in any way, but a large number of people have a very superficial understanding of the real sophisticated nature, either of war or of foreign policy or of diplomatic policy. So let me tackle those issues in turn. I need not say a lot about the level of polarization in American society, and I would venture to say in the world today. We live in a very, in a world of disruption. We live, and I, I probably would not be overstating it if I said we live in an age of rage. And this becomes a huge problem in, at least in the American context as I see it. And I would certainly welcome your, your questions, corrections, and comments on this. I think it becomes a huge problem when you're trying to mobilize a country for essentially an indefinite engagement, uh, whether it's against COVID or it's against a hybrid warfare waged by um, states uh, such as Russia and China, um, or it's the space race or it's the, the threat of climate change. It becomes a huge problem when you have disagreements in the society that become heated and unbridgeable and intractable. And a lot of times that's what we're seeing in American society today. And the answer to that, and here Clausewitz comes perfect because that's the play in the subtitle of my new upcoming co-authored book on mediation, which is called Mediation, Negotiation by Other Moves, which is a play obviously on Clausewitz politics as, po you know, war as politics by other means. I think the answer to polarization is mediation. And we need leaders, and this is a, a, another one of those easy but difficult, easy to say but difficult to execute calls. We need leaders, civilian, military, business, who are willing to bring people together and facilitate conversations. This is very easy to say, and that's all I'm going to leave it as at this point in the interests of time, but I'd be more than happy to talk more about how that might be done in the, in the Q&A. So one problem to staying power is polarization, and the answer for that, I would argue, is mediation. The second problem that I pointed out, and I will conclude on, on this point, the second problem is the, as I called it, the superficialness of a lot of the public, at least in the United States, at least as I observe it, of their understanding of what war really means, of what diplomacy really means. I just give you two quotes that stood out to me very strongly. One is by Major General Bill Rapp, former commandant at the West Point and uh, US Army War College, and currently at Harvard Kennedy School. And he wrote several years ago, as a society, Americans are intrigued by the lure of precise, discriminate military weaponry. 
and dismayed when such expensive tools fail to achieve lasting results. And a similar quote by a former diplomat, David Newsom, who said, the American view of diplomacy is a mixture of ignorance of its details, suspicion of its objectives, contempt for its importance, and fascination with its romance. That's the statement of the problem. So what would be my proposed solution as complicated as it is? And the proposed solution is the one that Madeleine Albright has articulated several uh, years ago, which is to make foreign policy, and I will add military policy, diplomatic policy, less foreign. And for that, we need statesmen, we need leaders, military leaders, academic leaders, as educators. And in, 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 in concluding this, I would I draw back and I, and I comment back on what uh, General Vigilant said this morning about transformative pedagogy or what Peter Singer talked about when, when he talked about useful fiction. I think we need to rethink how we talk to the public, we all, all of us, academic leaders, military leaders included, how we talk to the public. And maybe, and the, the, though this is highly provocative thought, I am sure, maybe Twitter is not the most effective way to communicate the nuanced complexity of war, whether it's again with discrete uh, outcome or not. So those are some, some thoughts on the challenge of achieving staying power and tackling polarization with mediation and tackling the superficial understanding of war with statesmen and leaders being educators. I'd welcome your comments and thank you so much for having me here today again. Thank you very much, Eugene, uh, for a fascinating presentation. And uh, again, a great link in to, uh, to Ike Wilson uh, when you talk about the role of the military and their responsibilities in responding to leaders and to societies. Uh, so Dr. Ike Wilson III deserves his reputation as a versatile and innovative soldier scholar. He's a decorated combat veteran with multiple combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and extensive experience across the greater Middle East. He's nationally and internationally recognized as an advocate for change in how America understands and deals with matters of security affairs and the use of force, both in times of peace and war. He also, which is very dear to my heart, talks a lot about disruptive change and how that continues to outpace organizations, organizational leadership and the ability to think and act quickly and effectively, which is so important to what we're talking about today. Before arriving at the Joint Special Operations University and US Special Operations Command, he served as director of the US Army's Strategic Studies Institute and US Army War College Press, as well as being a senior lecturer with the Yale Jackson Institute of Global Affairs at Yale University. For me, he epitomizes the ideal of the modern soldier and we'll speak on that topic. So Ike, over to you, please. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much. And um, let me just thank uh, uh, Ecole de Guerre and the organizers and hosts who have been uh, incredibly gracious by even allowing me to join this august group of uh, uh, thinking doers. Um, I, I owe uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kogan, and Eugene, a great uh, special thanks because uh, you did for me what uh, 30 plus years in the military was was not able to do to me. You uh, promoted me to general today, so uh, I'll try to I'll try to live up to it. And it's again, I just want to say, uh, at the risk of embarrassment, um, I just want to say how great it is to uh, virtually sit next to uh, uh, Admiral um, retired uh, uh, Bill McRaven, uh, uh, sir. Always great to see you, and hope I don't let, let you down with my uh, playing the role of a futurist today. Um, last panelist speaking at the last panel of a conference. Uh, that's uh, pretty daunting. Um, and again, anyone who knows me, uh, I am cursed with the uh, gift of gab or um, uh, mouth mouthiness out itis. So I'm going to try to go to a bit of a script. I'll apologize. I'm going to bring up a couple of pictures also to kind of squeeze an extra thousand or 10,000 words in into a few moments. But what I mainly want to do today is I want to take on the, uh, the mission I've been given to play the futurist. Peter Singer is a real futurist. 
Peter, my apologies. I'm going to try to play one. You give me a grade at the end of the day. Um, but I want to paint a picture. And I think it's important to paint a landscape. And I think our, our um, uh, panelists throughout the day have done a beautiful job. Um, in some literal sense, our first panelists starting out with art, art as, uh, as imitation of life or vice versa, life as an imitation of art. Um, and I wanna, I wanna uh, paint a picture forward of at least the broadest strokes because we don't have a whole lot of time, but at least to provoke some ideas of the landscape and bring us back to what we in the special operations community call soft truth number one, right? The human comes first, human over hardware. Not, not, not ma magically and massively divorced from hardware, but human first in those human technological relationships. I'll come back to that in the end, but I wanna paint a picture I'm going to also, like um, uh, Eugene has done in uh, um, Admiral McRaven, put three insights on the table. And since I'm going to play the futurist today, we'll call those insights foresights. And you'll be the judge. A um, couple more things on preamble, and I'll get right into insight one, and I'll pull up a couple of pictures just to, uh, to paint it forward a bit. First and foremost, in terms of a preamble, um, I want to frame tomorrow's um, Universal Soldier, and that's the title I've been given. Please, everyone, every time I say Universal Soldier, have the suspicion and the scare and skeptical quotes in mind. And I'll probably do this from time to time to keep us to keep us in that in that uh, in that spirit. Um, but I want to paint. I want to frame it around the prototype of today's and frankly the last hundred years of um, the special operator. Right, I'm going to do that for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is uh, because in the broadest, most meta description and definition of the special operator, the special leader operator, the special forces professional, it means different than the regular and the conventional. Exquisitely so in terms of tradecraft and toolcraft, but it means different. And I would offer my second point because what has been different and special in terms of the universal soldiers of the past and the present, will I would offer in terms of this forecasted future forward be and become, must be and become the new conventional. And so as we think about and understand and gave, got a better understanding of our special operators, joint cross services within a nation state and combined multinational allies and partners, um, what we understand is special today will become the new conventional. So I'm gonna use universal soldier and soldiering um, uh, uh, mix match with uh, my specific talk of special forces and special operations and special forces leader operator. Uh, lastly, my every waking and sleeping moment as the president of Soft University, uh, the Joint Special Operations University, as you would, as you would figure, uh, has been and must be um, all about this future, all about the current, leader operator, all about the next generation, what we're calling here in US SOCOM, the fourth age of spe the special operations professional. All my waking and unwaking moments are about thinking forward and retooling our teaching and learning research analysis and service outreach, everything we do to begin to plant those seeds now to germinate and grow for harvest going out for the next 50 plus years. And so that's the preambles. Uh, let's get, let me get to insight number one. Insight number one, a change and changing landscape must be appreciated first and foremost, and it's essential for getting the future portrait and prof profile of this universal soldier, getting it accurate. Let me um, fumble here for one second and see if I can pull up a slide, just to give you a picture. Okay. First and foremost, the Universal Soldier, Special Operations Force of the future, like the nations that they will serve and have served, are at, all at a threshold crossing of a next era, a new, what we call in uh, US Special Forces um, uh, Command, Special Operations Command, a fourth age. In fact, we may have uh, been through and well beyond this crossing for many years now, frankly. This new fourth age or next generation is one of compound security threats. You've heard many of those put forward today, a polycentristic reality of security and defense that transcends the traditional understandings of what constitutes the jurisdictional boundaries of security and defense, military, non-military, et cetera, et cetera. 
The future soldier, the universal soldier of the future will not necessarily be a universal warrior diplomat, a warrior developer, and a warrior defender and guardian when we bring in the space realm. Um, able to be and do polycentric things, right? To deal in a polycentric world. This new fourth age is one of compound security threats and a character of global geopolitical competition that is governed by a new and transformative compound security dilemma. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into that in the deep description, but uh, if you go to the JSAO um, uh, YouTube program, we have a theory of next. Frankly, I've been working on it. It's been body of my research for about 30 years now, I've brought it into Special Operations Command, intentionally so because Special Operations, vanguard to the vanguard force for the United States uh, in the coalitions and the Western liberal um, world order that um, at times chooses to follow our lead. Um, so being able to bring a theory of next like this to the table will give us the platform for understanding and appreciating, anticipating that landscape as it is changing and how it's changing. Multiplicative, it's not A plus B equals C, it's A times B times C equals something to the exponent. That's what our future leaders are gonna have to understand and embrace and become polycentric in all that they do. But those, uh, there are two videos there. They're very short on the YouTube channel. It gives you, gives everyone easy to access and gives you some nice B-roll that kind of describes that for you. I'll encourage you to look at it. And I, I've sent the organizers of the conference uh, links to those as well. Please uh, share those uh, freely and broadly. Now this compound security character of the global security environment is such that it demands a utility of, a future utility of that universal soldier, that soft, that special operator that is equally compounded that is to say a comprehensive combination of all the skills, techniques, and operational methods of all three preceding ages, if you will, amplified by 21st century technological advancements. Nothing less than this, nothing less than this comprehensive joint combined utility of universal soldiering from philosophy of culture, identity, and approach is required for overmatching power in and under these fourth age conditions. Nothing less than a trans everything view of an approach to universal soldiering. Now growing, fostering, preserving and sharpening the edge of the fourth age soft universal soldier for all of our nations, not themselves. Again, quiet professionalism, humility to the purpose, not the military instrument of the thing. And never, I'll quote Clausewitz, I have to everyone has done so so far, that supreme judgment, never breaking the supreme judgment that Klaus was gives us of divorcing the political object from the military object or any object of instrumentation. For when you do so, you create something pointless and devoid of all sense. If only Klaus were completely right in that regard, pointlessness and, and divorce of all sense would leave us standing pat, even Stephen. Unfortunately, oftentimes it creates something that's much more of a deleterious, grotesque outcome in terms of achievement of a relative peace as we can come to know it. Um, th there are six core principles of leader development that we are planting the seeds on now that will manifest in the next two to three generations that will develop that universal soldier that we're talking about. Let me, let me just script through them really quick. First, future universal soldiers, those future special operators, leader operators, will have to understand the security environment in the contributions of all instruments of power. Secondly, they'll have to anticipate and respond to surprise and uncertainty. Thirdly, they'll have to anticipate, recognize change and lead those changes through transitions. Fourth, they must be able to operate on intent through trust, empowerment and understanding. Fifthly, they have to be able to make and act on ethical decisions based on shared values of the professions, not just of arms, uh, but of all instruments of power. And sixthly, they must be able to think creatively, critically, in strategically and applying joint special operations forces warfighting principles, those universal warrior diplomat development and defender and guardian principles and concepts in the whole of government, whole of nations, GMC, joint interagency, intergovernmental, multinational, all those buzzwords must become real and embedded in the DNA of the future universal soldier. See if I can get one more. Okay, good. Now the new realities of today and tomorrow's compound security dilemma governed global security environment will demand nothing less than this universal soldier. 
that while retaining some of the core essence of the traditional soldier and soldiering uh, that we've come to know and, um, and that have been and are enduring, they must vitally be able to transcend at the same time those traditions, break those con continuation and continuity biases embedded within those notions of what constitutes a soldier and the, and the other than or non-soldier. And to become that, again, that universal warrior in a very polycentric way capable of producing the sorts of compound applications of what I'll call integrative statecraft that are necessary to overmatch the perils of compound security threats, some of which you see intimated on the slide in front of you, and more importantly, to effectively shape a better relative peace for all as we can come to know it, as Clausewitz said. Foresight number two, history is illustrative. It can also illuminate, but it does not repeat however we do. And especially when we do not recognize and heed its lessons, lessons for our futures. A back to the future point of view and approach is essential to understanding and creating and fostering this universal soldier. Now, despite the narrow focus on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency over the past 20 years that we've all faced, all of our nationhoods have faced, um, US led combined joint special operations forces have offered policymakers. Uh, across our coalitions, certainly what proved the sinqua non of America's and our coalition's fighting edge during the decades of counterterrorism and counterinsurgency, those last 20 years. Pinpoint focused on direct action rating, but not solely on direct action rating. SOF expands the range of military operations, both in quality and capability, and operational strategic utility of employment to enable other instruments of statecraft to succeed. That special operation is unique contribution is going to be conventional, necessarily conventional in the future universal soldier. Again, remember those scare quotes. Throughout the Cold War, again, a back to the future perspective real briefly, this soft, this soft full range of operational capacity offered nations like ours the ability to win without fighting, not to have to resort to armed conflict while always being prepared to do so. The, ways, the way and means of filling George Kennan's prescription of an active containment base national and grand strategy. Special operations forces have always done this, not just in the lower ends of a range or continuum or spectrum of peace and warfare, but continuously throughout. But importantly, at those spaces in between, those transition points between co cooperation and competition, between competition and the threshold of armed conflict, keeping things below the, arm, the threshold of armed classic armed conflict as much as and as long as possible, but always being prepared to be unbeatable and overmatching if and when wars come. In this new fourth age, geography has returned with a vengeance, vengeance as a governing dynamic of international relations and positional advantage is once again a determinative factor of this new compound security world order and disorder. I think I have another piece to show you here for that. Now, why is that so? because geostrategy is an essential element of the disruptors playbooks that we face today. Name in, we'll pinpoint China and Russia in that regard, but not solely China and Russia. And more pointedly to China's expansion globally as they seek to couple targeted control and access to key geostrategic locations to outmaneuver and hold at risk all of our nations, the Western liberal international community of democracy specifically, all of our, um, of our nation's interests, regionally and globally, holding them at risk. Adversaries and competitors are now pursuing positional advantage through their strategies of action globally. These notions of old mercantilism, now I call it new, uh, neo mercantilism of the 21st century, that will be the world disorder going forward. Beggar thy neighbor, increase transactional approaches to applications of force for some suspicious power purposes and a disruption of the standing international order that is that is stood um, in order, relatively speaking, since 1945, in some elements of its progeny uh, or its uh, ancestry going all the way back to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. All that being under what I might call a globalizing insurgency against the principles and norms, the rules and decision-making procedures of that Western liberal, small West, small L, uh, international relative order. Competitors and adversaries like China are using, are looking in, uh, to uh, futures, uh, hearkening back to past and um, uh, to past ge geostrategic thinkers uh, and strategists like uh, Mackinder, Alfred Thayer Mahan and others and contemporizing their strategies as spheres of influence 
by way of trans-regional and global spanning updates and applications of concepts like Heartland, Rimland. Uh, tomorrow's victories and losses will play out at what George Kennan called the strong points. Now those strong points are certainly gonna be those same historical geographic places, but they're gonna be those nexes where ge geography and geostrategy comes into collision with human security at those root cause levels that those underlying current levels as Noel Boss of mine coined the phrase of, um, in ideational, in the ideational realm, right? Tomorrow's universal soldier, like today's in the past special operator, must become native to these nexes locations and these nexes, these spaces in between. SOP has always lived in such places and spaces. Foresight three, and, I'll, and I'm close to concluding here. The portrait of the future universal soldier must be beyond war and be capable of thinking beyond war and foresighting the peace as we can come to know it. Now, you, United States Special Operations Community now speaks towards what you probably heard and read about, the hyper-enabled operator or the HEO concept. That individual who's intended to be a soft professional empowered by technologies that accelerate tactical decision-making by increasing situational awareness and reducing cognitive workload. No single technology certainly will independently make operators hyper-enabled. However, instead operators, leader operators will become hyper-enabled through the integration of technologies. Now I would say the future universal soldier will need to be, certainly be uh, future professionals of integrative statecraft in technologists in this regard. The future generations will be digital natives. But more importantly than being an expert in the ones and zeros, even when the future operators are digital natives and being savvy in that regard to the current fourth technological revolution, more importantly, I would offer is that universal soldier of the future has to be savvy to the usefulness and utility of emergent technology. Hyper enablement will be vital to tomorrow's universal soldier, but even more vital will be ensuring that the future HEO professional will be at least equally highly educated and responsible. And what we, we're, we're doing deep dive studies on this so that we can ensure that as we hyper enable that the future leader operator, that we're also highly, they're making that future operator, that universal soldier, highly educated, hyper enabled, responsible operator. And that's hero. So the universal soldier of the future will be the hero of the future. Let me, uh, let me just conclude with uh, bringing us back to the human dimension. Um, as it has been in the past, it will be in the future uh, going forward. And um, I wanna bring us back to the human dimension. The fidelity or trust bond of the, of the professional the universal soldier of the future, that universal warrior, diplomat, defender, guardian, and developer, um, the fidelity or trust bond of those individuals to their national publics and to their nationals, na nation's vital interests, including commitments to their allies and partners, has always found its strongest roots in the rich soils of those nationhoods histories, and for our, for, for, for our sake, American history. Examples set by leaders from uh, America's uh, General George Washington, frankly, Admiral Bill McRaven, reinforced the principle of subordination of the practitioner and particularly the military practitioner to civilian authority, to the peace objective, and through that authority to the security and defense of their nationhoods. Today's and tomorrow's compound security dilemmas demand a restriking of that critical balance of fidelity with the general wills of the societies that we hail from, serve, and repatriate back to you after we leave the uniform. Between special operations forces, exquisitely specialized warfighting acumen, and the nations that they serve, their core values. As it was and has always been, so it shall continue to be. And with that, uh, thank you again, probably for the extra time I stole, um, and I look forward to uh, questions, commentary, and future continuing relationships. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much for that, and, and a, a tour de force, not just in the context of the military, but bringing us, I was going to say full circle, but that's very difficult when we're talking about a triangle, but uh, you know what I mean, we come back to the, the start point. Um, <clears throat> I'm afraid, gentlemen, you have been uh, victims of your own success, and there are lots and lots of questions to pose to you, uh, for which I'm, I'm delighted, and thank you. Uh, one of the questions that, that came up uh, was about whether you would agree that war is first won or lost on the home front? And if so, how can the military be part of this investment battle? Uh, 
Admiral Bill, would you like to come yeah. in first? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Happy to answer that. You know, I think it's uh, that, that may be a little bit of an oversimplification. Uh, I mean, I can I can give you a lot of examples where you know the American public didn't even know where Grenada was, didn't understand why Panama was important, uh, didn't know where Bosnia and Kosovo were. You know, so I don't know that you always have to have you know support from the home front uh, to to take military action. Now. Uh, you know, the, the other side of that, of course, is Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the, the long nature of that war, um, you know, uh, the, as Eugene talked about, you know, the sustainability, the this, this stick to itness. You've got to have that for the long wars or you're just never going to come to a successful conclusion. So I don't know that you can say categorically you always have to have the home front uh, behind you. It depends upon the duration and the nature of the action itself, I think. Thank you. Eugene, uh, you were focusing particularly on the society element, so I'd be interested in your take on that question. Completely agree with, with uh, Admiral McRaven's observation that obviously short, short engagements are uh, much, if you will, easier uh, or uh, to, to pursue without considerable uh, public, public engagement. Um, the longer they are, Right, the more you need uh, the, the the public to be with you, and the more the increase uh, concomitant increase with the need to educate the public about the engagement, and specifically, if I may just follow up on a theme that both uh, both of my co-panelists uh, is the notion of is the idea of history is the topic of history, which is critical. Um, understanding the educating the public about the history of the country, society, where the United States or any other country will be engaged uh, to have a better sense of the context in which you will be sending your young men and women. Uh, extremely, extremely important. And again, I come back to the issue of providing opportunities for, in this case, military leaders to interact with civilian leaders. At Harvard, we have been very fortunate under General Rapp, uh, Bill Rapp's leadership to, on a yearly basis, have for civilian, uh, civilian academics like myself to study alongside uh, with and to learn from military leaders lieutenant colonels, colonels, generals who come to study in our executive programs from whom we learn a lot and who very graciously humble us with, with telling us that, that they've learned something from us. So I, I would again call for, encourage, praise the, the idea uh, that, you know, getting, providing opportunities for the military and the civilians to mingle, if you will, and to learn from one another can really help us um, enhance this, this type of societal coherence and, and sophisticated understanding of the military policy that we Thank you, and I understand the points that you're you're both mentioning in the context of the deployment of military forces where there is a, a decisive activity to be undertaken. I wondered the broader sense of where we have this idea of persistent competition. We see adversaries who are trying to undermine us domestically. Uh, I wonder your thoughts on the societal resilience element in that. And I think, Eugene, it probably plays to your point about polarization, which of course is something that we know adversaries are exploiting in our societies today. Um, but Ike, did you want to come in on, on this particular question? I'll just, uh, since I stole so much time, extra time in my presentation, I'll keep it very brief. Let me say provocatively, but um, not just to be quippish, I, I truly believe this. I unfortunately, I unfortunately have to agree with my, my two uh, colleagues in uh, the answer to the, the, the basic answer to the question of, no, not in all cases is it required. Uh, we have, we're replete with examples 
And as the world turns, you know, in hindsight being tw better than 2020, thankfully so, uh, that um, with simple authorizations to use military force, uh, we can actually achieve um, great, uh, and I would importantly put the caveat on tactical to grand tactical, low operational successes, battle to battle. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I have uh, uh, Dr. Um, Hoser, Huser, uh, in the first presentation today, really ringing in my ears. Um, really a, 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 a subtle, not so subtle um, caution that uh, harkens back to that Klaus Witzian grand uh, warning of be careful just because you can, maybe you should not. And on that piece, I'll go a little bit more nor normative and conclude with this, why I say I unfortunately uh, have to agree. Normatively, um, and especially true for the American Constitutional Republic, and I would say um, democracies writ large, and the community of democracies, it's important to declare things. And as much as possible um, to be able to anticipate and foresight and know your interests, unilaterally and more importantly, multilaterally as we look forward in these futures of compounded uh, opportunities and threats that have to be uh, uh, dealt with, the power equation from a unilateral sense does not equate under those con con conditions. So the idea of force even has to be much more ecumenical in now this idea of by, with, and through allies and partners, not a nice to have, an essential thing if you want to achieve quote unquote victory. I think part of that in terms of the domestic realm that shapes policy of all types, particularly international relations and foreign policy is important for democracies as, as at any given tactical moment, as restraining as it may feel in contrast comparison with our, our more authoritarian um, adversaries who seem to be unshackled from these pesky things like laws and rules and norms and we the people governing and regulating authorities over our uses of, and utility of any type of force. Uh, we need to go back to our constitutions, small c and large c, and understand that the war power is we the people. We intentionally uh, have a single power that is separated through, shared through separate institutions, checks upon checks. And the last time from a US standpoint, we've had over 287, I believe, uses of military force interventions since the last formally declared war. And that was World War II from the US sense. For the last 15 years, we've operated under a authorization to use military force prescribed initially and pointedly for the Iraq war. Um, we're still operating off of that. Um, that really stretches the fabric and really stretches that thing that I talked about at the end of my comments of the fidelity or trust bond between the governed and, and the governors. Um, I, would, I would leave it at that. Um, Thank you, Mike. Um, we've had a number of questions that have picked up on the question, uh, Eugene, as you put it, as, as pedagogy, but it's about education. Uh, th there's a question here uh, for you, Eugene, that says, tackling a superficialness with education, how would you approach this equitably when much of the issue is rooted in structural inequality? So for me, there's a question there and a second uh, question, which probably is more directed at you, Ike, which is um, given the required abilities you list for the international or the, um, the, the, this international soldier, universal soldier, which skill is the most critical that's currently missing and will be the most difficult to develop? So Eugene and Admiral Bill, if you'd like to take the first one about you know, how do we grow the kind of leader that you're talking about, how do we address inequ structural inequality that may alienate parts of society? And Ike, if you can pick up on that last one about what's missing skill-wise from the universal soldier. Thank you. Admiral McRaven, I'm, I'm happy to let you go first. No, by all means, Eugene, over to you. Um, the structural inequality, I've, I've come back to my, to my uh, key argument about mediation. Uh, and, the, and the argument is very simple. You have to have a space where safely, safely controversial, heated disagreements, controversial ideas and heated disagreements can be raised, whether they're structural or they are, um, or they're not. And I would say that that calls for, and I, am, I was delighted that President Biden, for example, in the United States, has called during the campaign for the mediation of our differences. I think the call for unity is very ambitious and uh, aspirational, 
But I think what we need is a space, whether it's a virtual space hosted by senior political military leaders, or it's in a physical space where conversations can take place in an environment where ideas can really be generated, if you will, a macro brainstorming session where differences can be genuinely debated. Um, that would be my kind of a short, short answer. And again, I think that getting, again, military leaders interacting with civilian leaders at these, uh, at these events at, in these spaces would be highly beneficial so that we don't end up in an echo chamber talking to, talking to ourselves, but where we can hear genuinely different perspectives. I'll pass it back to Admiral McRaven. Uh, thanks, Eugene. You know, I'll, I'll take it from a little bit of a different angle here. I mean, we, we all know that education is the great equalizer. And so when you have kind of structural problems uh, with education, you've got to begin with the pipeline. Uh, I, when I retired from the military, I became the chancellor of the University of Texas system. That's uh, 14 institutions, 230,000 students, 100,000 employees. And, and you realize that the inequities in education kind of start, you know, frankly, at you know, the, the pre-K level, uh, pre-kindergarten in the US, and then the, the whole pipeline from K through 12 has got to be structured so that everybody has an equal opportunity to excel. Uh, so, so you realize by the time they get to an, an institution of higher education, if they weren't reading at fourth grade level, they're gonna have a tough time getting into a, a quality university. So the structural problems that end up manifesting themselves around the situation room table, uh, the, the operations table, the pick a table and a theater of war begin literally at the beginning. So one of the things we did uh, within, within the state of Texas is we're always focused on the pipeline to ensuring that we have maximum opportunities for everybody to come into that pipeline to get the quality education they need because that will affect our, our decision makers in the future. I was often asked when I was the chancellor, uh, because everybody kind of knew my military background, I would have these town hall meetings with donors and the public, and invariably somebody would raise the issue of, what do I think the number one national security issue is? And they always assumed I would answer, you know, North Korea or Iran or Russia or China. And my answer was always the same, K through 12 education. And they'd say, no, no, no. I mean, what's the, the biggest national security issue? K through 12 education. I said, because if we are not educating the young men and women today to think critically, to have the STEM skills, the science and the technical, the technical and the math skills to do the job, if we are not teaching them about other cultures and, and if we're not teaching them history, then we will not have the leaders we need in national security to be able to make the correct decisions. Either, either in the civilian arena or the military arena. So uh, the inequity is there, but it's not something we can solve, you know, by the time it gets to college, by the time it gets to the military, we as a nation, certainly speaking for the United States, we've got to go back at the beginning, make sure the pipeline and the structure is correct there. It will, it will lead to better outcomes. Thank you. And uh, Ike, the question for you was about the skills of the future universal soldier. And uh, if I could be cheeky and squeeze one more in, what role do you think AI will play in the development of that future universal soldier? And I think that will be all we have time for, I'm afraid. Okay, real briefly, um, lots, of, lots of things, lots of things to put on the table, but the essential thing, I would say, and we're really moving forward in, uh, with JSAL uh, uh, Soft University, the uh, Joint Special Operations University, what we call JSAL Next, our change leadership reform agendas um, to make the university more anticipatory and perspective, right? Anticipatory and perspective. And so with that, foresighting, embedding within the future, um, thinking doer, soldier, warrior, scholar, a confidence, a humble confidence, in foresighting and anticipating futures. Certainly threats, but equal to those threats as the Chinese write it in two brush strokes, right? Um, uh, danger riding on the dangerous, or opportunity riding on the dangerous winds, the definition of crisis, 
not only looking at troubles, but looking at opportunities to um, pursue and exploit, to put it in the, in the military vernacular. But that foresighting, that strategic and operational foresighting capability, and it sounds very simple, but again, like Coswood said, it's very simple, but very difficult in the doing. It requires anticipation that comes from a deep understanding of theory, relevant theory, applied theory, not just theory for the sake of theory, but of applications and that, that gives and builds a strategic mindedness. A reach deep dive in relevant, relevant history, what I'll call historical mindedness and getting out of the cerebral in the conceptual, in the theoretical and the historical and actually going out and being an, app, an applier. You know, many of our audience are not old enough to probably remember the series, right? But becoming Indiana Joneses, where you are teaching by day in the traditional sense, but you are on, on your off hours, if you will, you're out there in the field doing quote unquote archeology. span um, I think nothing short of that is required. It's an and not an or. And so from relooking our faculty blend, a mix of ac professors of academic discipline and professors of practice, we are, we are um, refreshing the Joint Special Operations University professorate, um, adding to the great body of professors we already have with new, new talent, new skills, polymaths, and those polycentric leaders. You gotta get the faculty development right in order to get what uh, Admiral McRaven put on the table, getting the education. Comprehensive joint combined readiness is essential and the bedrock of that is this kind of education that builds in that anticipatory foresighting capability and capacity, and I'll pause there. Oh, you, I'm sorry, Paul, you'd ask AI. Uh, yes, hyper enablement, eight, one, the one big thing that I think AI will do and must do, or we need to throw it out for the future universal soldier and the nations that they, that they serve is to eliminate the, those things that would be the mundane so that we can free the cognitive mind and the physical body of the human agent so that they can do that thing I just talked about, anticipation and foresighting, on the move, right? Uh, my grand concern and the reason why the university has to keep up with entities like acquisition technology and logistics, as we build the for through technology development, um, we hyper enable, we also have to keep pace if not be vanguard to the change that technology brings with hyper um, cognitive development and um, cognitive relief in education, else the disruptive aspects of technology will not be pointed towards the adversary and the enemy, it'll disable ourselves and our own universal soldiers. So I would leave it at that. Thank you. And uh, gentlemen, if I could just say thank you very much for your fascinating insights into this, this question, which I thought was a difficult question. You convinced me it was a simple question. It's just the answer that's difficult. Uh, so I'm very grateful. Uh, the audience, I'm sure, would wish to applaud you now. So on their behalf, thank you all very much. I apologize to those in the audience who asked questions that we didn't have the chance to get around to, but it's indicative, I think, of the quality of this panel that it inspired so many questions. But if the simple things are difficult, I think history proves that there are some solutions. All we have to do is try to work through how we connect society, leaders, and the military, and then, as Ike finished off with, the idea that you have to do that within coalitions or alliances just to add to the complexity is something that we have to deal with. And I think for me, the challenge, and Ike, you alluded to it, Eugene, you spoke about it, as did you, Admiral Bill, is how do we have the people and the organisations that can deliver the kind of complexity? It's not just about the equipment. It's about those organisational and human elements that we need to consider as we go forward. And on that point, Benjamin, if I can pass back to you with thanks again to my panel and the audience for fantastic questions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.